Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the CEU Executive MBA Bucharest Budapest Sofia Open Day. My name is Thomas Lamel. I'm the Senior Program Manager of the CEU Executive MBA, and I will guide you through this evening. First of all, we'll start with the program presentation. Um, so you'll have the opportunity to learn more about the program itself, followed by a, a short introduction with um, one of our current participants with um, Elena Inace and um, followed by a keynote presentation by one of our faculty members and a Q&A session in the end. P please feel free to shoot in your questions in the chat box, whatever questions you might have. I will collect them for the Q&A session in the end. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our host to you tonight because we are uh, partnering with Advantage Austria here in Bucharest tonight. And I would like to give the floor to Stefan Stürzer, the Deputy Commercial Attaché here at the Austrian Embassy and the Austrian Chamber of Commerce here in um, Bucharest. Please, Stefan. Thank you, Thomas. Hello and welcome. Good evening from Bucharest. Um, as Mr. Lammel said, I'm the Deputy Head of Advantage Austria. What is Advantage Austria? Uh, our name, Advantage Austria, is we are a support agency for Austrian business in Romania, in Budapest, and in Sofia. Um, but we are also part of the embassy. We are the commercial section of the embassies. Um, our task is to help uh, the business, the bilateral business between our countries. Um, I'm glad you are here. And I just wanted to tell you about the situation in Romania, but it's, it's similar to the other countries. We are number two investors in Romania. We have um, 3,400 countries uh, companies present here more than 1,500 all, um, almost active, really active, and we are number two investors. What does it mean? There are a lot of Austrian companies, uh, they are investors, they are long-term stable partners in each country, and of course, they are good employers. So um, a study in Austria, maybe with an uh, Austrian university, will broaden, will not only broaden your horizons, it's a very interesting experience and a very profitable investment and the case and i can say also from my from my own experience studying in austria is a very pleasant experience vienna is a beautiful city it ranks almost um, in the first or second places in all rankings for living quality so it would be a really interesting and pleasant um, experience for you so thank you very much. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure hosting you, and I hope um, a nice evening. Uh, uh, I hope a, a profitable evening. If you have any questions, we're always here. Our network is always open to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. So let's get to the program presentation itself. Um, the problem you're facing right now, in in terms of a pandemic or even without the pandemic, is the question: Is an MBA still worth it? Because you don't have to go very far these days to encounter that we are witnessing fundamental transformations in the world in a century. In 2008, we've witnessed a big financial crisis. In 2015, we've seen a large refugee crisis. And right now, we are living in the biggest pandemic in over a century. So these changes are part of a much broader set of transformation that is taking place. And some of them are positive, and some of them are pretty dangerous, to be honest. So the key question is, how do we as business professionals, how do you as business professionals prepare for this challenging and unpredictable environment? And the obvious question is, is an MBA the way to do it? We've seen an explosion of online education, and I'll show you why we believe that our MBA is worth it. If you're interested in further education, you use usually start searching for an MBA in the city you live in. What you tend to find is mostly a pretty standard MBA curriculum, an MBA without, without a specific perspective, without a spe specific expertise, and uh, without a mission. The number, the faculty who are delivering the program are pretty much local in those programs. And so is the number of international students. It's a relatively low international student body. Some programs in Western Europe can be quite expensive, starting at 60,000 euro or even more. And local programs allow you not to leave your job. 
If you contrast this with the top business schools in the world, they often have a very differentiated curriculum. It's very, they offer a certain perspective, a certain expertise, expertise or offer a certain mission. They're mission driven. Because of the full time format, their student body is international actually. But you're leaving the labor market for at least one year or sometimes even two years, which is another financial burden in addition to tuition. These, speaking of tuition, these programs are rather expensive at more than 120,000 euro or even more. And another thing that you might need to consider is that you may have to move your family to the new MBA location. So what we do at CU is to offer the best of two worlds. There is no work interruption, thanks to the practical and flexible modular format. I will talk about this format later. As I've already mentioned the mission and the perspective, the executive MBA at CU is very much mission driven. I will talk about the executive MBA for the open world philosophy later. We have an international student body because of the modularity of the program. Participants can fly in, can fly out, which is a major advantage of the program. And according to the Times Higher Education, we are the second most international university in the world, which is being reflected in the alumni body and the actual student body at the moment. And when we say world-class faculty, we really mean it. For, ex for example, for economics, I want to introduce you to Mark Kaufman and applied theory with a PhD from Harvard. Or if you're new to finance, Joy is a uniquely gifted educator. Generation after generation um, of our students just tell us how she's just great in uh, 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 explaining complex financial concepts to our participants. Or the course on big data and artificial intelligence taught by Miklas Koren one of the leading scholars in this field in Europe with a Harvard PhD. Or Sophia Barani with a PhD from LSE. She's an expert on the future of work, which um, also includes um, artificial intelligence, robotics, etc. Or our faculty director, Professor Maciej Kieślowski, with degrees from uh, Yale, from INSEAD, and an MPA from Princeton. He's an expert on non-market strategy and, and regulatory issues. Professor Aysu Senius from, um, um, with a PhD from Florida. She's an expert on marketing and emotional marketing. And if you're already experienced in finance, you'll be placed in the advanced track course with Adam Savadovsky, um, a leading expert on complex investments with a PhD from Princeton. For leadership, Austin, our world-class psychologist with executive education experience on four continents, he will lead the way. And last but not least, for strategy, you'll have Yusuf, who has taught in more than 40 countries and advises leading Fortune 500 companies. That's just the selection of our faculty. And here is a selection of our visiting faculty. Um, for example, Christian Zelos, an innovation expert from Stanford University, Miklos Savary, an expert in digital marketing from Colombia. Omar, Omar Hernandez, an expert on operations management from Berkeley. Or Hui Jen, Professor Hui Jen from the University of Zurich. Or for our Sofia guest online tonight, uh, Dr. Milena Nikolova, who is um, Chief Behavior Officer at Behavior Smart in Sofia. So here's what the program looks like. It's a 10 module program. The dates you see on the screen right now are not going to change. So you can basically plan your studying around professional and family activities based on these dates. As you can see, we have three modules in the first year, which is the top row, four in the second year, the center row, and three in the third year, which gives you full flexibility and balance in your life. You might have noticed that we are piggybacking around popular European holidays like May 1st, November 1st, or August 15th, when it's easier for you to take time off and actually attend the modules. In the summers, which is this, the center column, our bespoke and cutting edge leadership program takes place on our Buda, beautiful Budapest campus 
and you'll have the opportunity to benefit from electives from the faculty in the world that we invite to teach your classes. So there will come eventually the day when you finish with us and you will join the CEU alumni from around the world. As I already said, CEU is the second most international university in the world, and you can rely on an active elite network on every continent. We have city level chapters, we have country level chapters, basically wherever you are in the world, wherever you go in the world, you'll find CEU alumni to interact with. And thanks to our very American approach, we're, in, we're an American and Austrian university, this alumni network is easy to approach and easy to reach out to. Um, this network is a network that you can count on and one of the key assets that we have. So the question is, how are we able to offer such a high quality program at only 29,000 euro of tuition? The answer is simple and lies in our founder and benefactor, George Soros, who created CEU with the mission to promote open society. Just recently, George Soros made a further contribution to CEU's mission by offering another billion dollars, billion with a B, an endowment to create the Open Society University Network, which means we are the best endowed university in Europe. So what does the Executive MBA for the open world mean? What makes CEU unique? First of all, when we talk about open, the open world, we mean skepticism towards dogmas, towards hierarchies and privileges, both in context of how we teach but also in composition of the cohort, because diversity for us is key to creating a successful program. For us, it's not just an empty marketing catchphrase. Secondly, we believe in debate and radical rational thinking. Every idea can be challenged because we believe in facts and arguments rather than narratives and fake news, because it's narratives and fake news that create polarization in our societies these days. And we believe the best way to challenge this, this narrative-based discourse is to make arguments based on facts and realities, which is the hallmark of Karl Popper's definition of open societies. We are fundamentally opposed to all kinds of discrimination, and we actively promote diversity within our program. The way we finance the scholarship means we create opportunities for people who traditionally have not been able to join such a high quality program. And one another thing that distinguishes us from other programs is that we see managers, not just as people who deal with businesses or resources, but we also believe that managers go beyond that. They are positive change agents. Whatever their position is, whatever their professional and academic background is, they are positive change agents in their very positions. So what does the CEU classroom look like? Currently, we have 64, 65 managers in the current cohort with an average of 14 years of work experience, including a minimum of three years of leadership or managerial experience. As you can see from the background image, um, we use state-of-the-art classroom technology and setups in order to facilitate discussion and, in, and interaction in class. We make use of case-based learning rather than traditional lectures that you would find in local MBA programs. Because we want to take you, experts in your very field, in your specific field, from this level of functional expertise to the strategic level. In times like this, of course, we offer um, online experience as well. We encourage everybody to join on site because the best learning experience is uh, executed on site. But of course, we understand that some people cannot or don't want to travel and want to participate online. We offer a hybrid option in all the modules. So every participant can choose freely to join online if they want to. We have invested in heavily in studio grade microphones, capturing lecture and all participants, because we don't consider education and learning as a one way street from the lecturer 
to the participant only, but it's also an exchange between the participant and the lecturer and among your fellows, among participants. That's where um, the learning kicks in. We've invested in large screens and high quality cameras. We have created physical virtual breakout rooms for support teams that you can see in this picture in the presentation right now. Um, the support teams are a very uh, unique thing that we create. It's, part, it's an essential part of your group work over the modules. And we allocate people in the support teams in order to expose themselves to as much diversity as possible. You will not be placed in a support team with people coming from the same industry, coming from the same country, coming from the same linguistic background, because diversity means you are, diversity means being exposed to different ways of thinking, different ways of solution making, of decision making, different ways of teamwork. And this is where learning kicks in. If you're exposed to different kinds of perspective and we proactively enforce diversity within these support teams. You might have noticed that there is a color code with these support teams in, in, this, um, in these virtual breakout rooms because we want you to, we want it for you to be easier to allocate to find out who's talking and which group do they belong to. Because part of our assessment in the modules is 360 degree uh, uh, peer evaluation, which means you're not going to be evaluated by your lecturers only in exams or presentations or whatever. You will be also assessed by your fellows and vice versa. You will assess all your fellows based on their interaction in class, their debate and their behavior in class and their teamwork skills. And of course, we offer high quality individual support on every level of your journey with us. From the moment you're inquiring with, with me or with us um, to um, actually applying for the program, to enrolling to the program, to being a participant of the program, to moving on to the alumni, we offer high quality individual support and we know your names. I've already mentioned the finance part, but um, let's talk about business here. Financing, the tuition is 29,000 euro of tuition. We offer a variety of scholarships and fellowships, which I might um, uh, talk about later. Um, the um, tuition is for the whole program and includes all the credits. We offer online participation for um, if traveling is inconvenient, if there's travel uh, restrictions, if there's no flights available or no visa being issued, um, we've seen it all during the pandemic, you can flexibly choose to participate online if you want to. In order to defray your other costs, we have special rates negotiated with partner hotels in Budapest and Vienna, ranging from the budget level to luxury level. And we've um, negotiated uh, discounts for flights with Austrian Airlines and Lufthansa Group uh, in order to get you to Vienna and get you to Budapest at a cheaper rate. So I would like to in invite you to join the open world. The application deadline is March 27, and the application starts online on our website. I strongly encourage everybody to apply as soon as possible because we have a first come first served policy on applications. So the sooner you apply, the sooner you're able to reserve your study seat and the sooner you have your admission decision. You're invited to book an, a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me to discuss your questions and optimize your application. I do understand that there might be questions that you might not want to discuss in an open setting like an open day. Feel free to book a one-on-one -on -one consultation to discuss financial support or your application. Um, I would like to move on to the next part, which I think, oh, let's, let's put it that way. I think it's clear that we are committed and very convinced of the program. Us from the program office, we are so much committed of the program and passionately convinced of this program. But it's another thing to hear about the program from people who are actually doing the program as participants. And that's why I invited um, tonight in Bucharest Elena Enash to, um, to speak to you, to introduce your, herself to you. She's Director of Applications and at European Delivery Center at Segeka here in Bucharest. 
and founder of Elevate Magazine. And Elena, if you could please join us for a second and tell us why you've chosen CEU Executive MBA back then. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm so happy that I'm here uh, and I want to welcome you here. Uh, it all sounded so nice, Thomas, when you, you said it, I was like, I'm so proud that I'm here. <laughs> I never heard this, actually. I, I, I never was, uh, was able to attend an open day. But, um, yeah, so the story is like that. I wanted to join an EMBA that's, uh, I don't know, that, that I can learn so many things um, I wanted to get to the next level, uh, just a bit about my background, I come from IT, uh, I've been a mobile developer for quite a few years and then I switched to management because somehow I felt that this is where I belong. Um, I wanted to have an impact on people's careers and I wanted to grow businesses and apparently this is what I'm good at. Uh, but I wanted something more. I wanted to be more involved in, in, in the social life. I wanted to know more people, to understand more how people think, how I can lead my team towards uh, to the next level. Um, so I was looking for an EMBA um, and everything that I was searching for, I don't know, it doesn't, did not fit like my program or did not fit like what I wanted to learn. Um, so then I discovered CU to actually to, to one of the teachers here. Uh, and they said, okay, you, you have to think about your future. You have to think about the best school that has the best potential to become so big and so famous and so good in the future um, that, that your, your diploma will, will be worth so much more than, than it is right now. Um, and um, what I liked about, so I decided, I think I decided almost in, after I had a discussion with you, I decided like, in the next minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yes, yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah. I, I know I'm impulsive, but uh, and yeah, let's let's put it like that because I think you're interested in why I um, I, I I got here. Um, first of all, the modular setting. I, I like it very much because it maps my program, it maps my schedule, and uh, besides of that. Uh, it really gets you focused there. So if you if you go uh, at work from Monday to Friday, and then you're on Saturday and Sunday, you basically go to to school to an EMBA. I think you're like super tired from work, and 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 then you have to be focused there, and then you have four homeworks, of course, because we're still in school, and and you have to prepare your projects or have some tests, and then you have work starting on on Monday. But uh, this summer, when I was like for a full 10, 10 days, yeah, 10 days in, in Budapest, uh, yeah, I was focused, I was there. I didn't even uh, read my emails. I didn't answer to any, any of my calls because I told everybody, so like 10 days I'm here and I'm focused and, and I, I really want to understand everything. So that, that's one, I mean, I think it's such a crucial part of, 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 of how you will um, map on your program. Uh, and especially if you have like executive positions, you, you really need some time to focus on both work and, and school. Um, the second thing is that I wanted an international exposure. I really wanted an international exposure. Um, and I would suggest to everybody, don't go to a school that's in your country. <laughs> uh, because, um, and don't go to a school that has people, a lot of people from, from only one country or from only one background or just two or three backgrounds. Uh, why I'm saying that because right now in my cohort, which I absolutely love and hi everybody, if somebody sees me, um, we're like 55 people from 30 countries uh, from all around the globe, which is amazing. My support team, which is, I, I really love my support team. We're like from five countries. We live in different countries than we are from um, and uh, we really do everything together. Um, and the most important part that also Thomas, you mentioned, it's, it's that we learn from each other a lot. Yeah, we learn from our teachers, we learn from uh, the courses that, that are presented to us and we are exposed to so many ideas. Um, but the, the, the biggest part of learning is from each other. It's like from learning cultures, learning uh, how they see uh, an issue, how they adapt to that, to that problem, how everything. 
for, for me, this is the, the biggest one of the biggest uh, um, gains that I that I, I sincerely uh, love about uh, about EU. And then, if I think about the, the third the third one, um, it's about debate. I can I, I always say this to Thomas. I love a good debate, and I think that. Uh, I was very surprised uh, that here uh, every idea it's listened to, every um, everybody has an opinion to say, and you can basically not dismiss that opinion, but you can learn from that and you can build upon on that. So I, I think that this is amazing, and um, I really needed that. I, I needed debate. I needed more ideas that are different from myself because this is how you 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 will grow in the future by having uh, by being exposed to different ideas to different people uh, and maybe people that you don't like at one point and you don't think like them uh, you will get to the next level if you if you are surrounded by these people so um, yeah just uh, I mean you just talked about debate I think that's just my personal opinion and I hope it's it's aligned with um, our mission with the open society mission that every idea can be challenged you don't have to necessarily agree with your fellows you don't have to agree with your teachers but we are open for uh, that part of feedback and your debate entries we are listening to what you have to say even though that your could be that your opinion is is controversial or um or um, um contradictory um, so um you've mentioned the the modules already i think that's a that's a huge part of our philosophy it's not just about setting dates it's about offering you offering executives the, the possibility to pursue higher education without interruption in the work life i mean just imagine you would be in a in a part-time or full-time mba program where you would need to travel like every two or three weeks to a program it, it it's of course it can be done but i think after two months you're basically sick of it because it doesn't leave any time and any space for you to do any um, work-related stuff anymore and any private issues anymore because you will always be focusing on the next on the next session on the next residency which is only 10 days away and that creates stress and that's why we came up with the modular format because it allows executives to there's no work uh, disruption you can basically join the modules around popular European holidays and we want you to focus on the module when you're in the module and we want you to focus on your job when you're on the job. It doesn't help you, it doesn't help us if you're in the module and besides working and vice versa, it doesn't help us and you if you're on, on your job and um, still working on your module and, and stuff like that. So we want you to be in a modular format without any work uh, disruption. Um, Elena already mentioned the diversity in, in class um, with regard to nationalities. And I, I do have the numbers, of course, I can tell you that we have people coming, flying in from as far away as Vancouver, Canada. We have people coming from India. We have even two Australians in the program. Um, one person from Malaysia, South Africa, and of course, Central and Eastern Europe and Western Europe and the Middle East. And another thing that the modular format allows is that modular format allows international people from far away to actually join, to commute to such a program. Because a, a format of, you know, every two weeks doesn't allow people from the US or from, from far away to actually join such a program because it's a matter of time management, it's a matter of money. Um, they're not able to travel like every two weeks to Vienna or Budapest. But a modular format allows you to commute to the module because it, it's only three modules a year and that's doable for executives and um, around popular European holidays. And just one last thing about diversity. Diversity for us is not just about nationalities and passports. It's about different perspectives. So we have people in the program, not just coming from diverse cultures, but also from very diverse backgrounds. We have people in the, in the program, of course, with a business background, with a finance background, but we also have people in the program coming from NGOs, from the public sector, entrepreneurs. We have artists in the program. We have uh, museum curators in the program, because at one point there will be a level in your job where you reach a leadership position where you need to understand the linguistics of business. Even though you are coming from human rights or the public sector, 
you need to understand the balance sheet. You would need to understand the linguistics of what is profit, what is loss, what is the balance sheet, etc. And we help you, whatever your background is, help you understand that language and get acquainted with that language. Uh, Elena, you perfectly sold the program, basically. If there's anything you would like to say? Um, um, I, I, yeah, I would also like to say that all these 10 modules, it does not finish. I mean, you will always be connected with CEU professors, your colleagues. You will have the projects that you can work on. And this is where the value gets on top of everything that you learn in class. Uh, this is where you get to work with people with different ways of thinking and different backgrounds that can that you can learn from them. And I can already say that in my day-to-day -day work, I now apply some things that I, I learned from my support group actually, and how they deal with most maybe stressful situation or, uh, yeah, so this is what I what I want to say. And um, I think that CU is an investment in your future. I, I really do think that. I'm a very passionate person about what I do. So. Uh, I think that CU will be very um, big in the future, so it will be a big investment that you will do for you yourself right now, uh, and you will see it's like uh, it's like Joy pitched us, <laughs> <laughs> investing in yourself, human capital. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned a good point that your journey with CU Executive MBA doesn't doesn't finish with your graduation. Of course, it's voluntary. If you want to, you're invited to, to join us for alumni courts um, offerings. We offer electives during the summer. So you can, again, during over um, popular European holidays like August 15th, it's your opportunity to come back to see you in a, in a course that you can freely select and to pursue um, further education on topics that you can freely decide and only on, the, on these topics. And you can reach out to our current participants and to alumni. So the whole network, you will be part of that network of that family um, even after your graduation. Thank you very much, Thank Elena. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank I would you. like to move on to the next part of this evening, to the academic part of tonight, to our keynote presentation um, delivered by Lutza Kerestegi. I'm joining us live from PEST, Analytics in Industry Digitalization. Lutza, are you there? Yeah. So, um, so what I'm doing right now in terms of data analytics is, um, is it data analytics in industry software? Um, it means that, uh, like, how you can actually digitalize the industry. That's the main question. And how you can apply data analytics in this environment. So I wanted to share with you more about um, what, what, what's happening in the industry right now and how much is digital transformation taking place. Um, I'm working with softwares. Um, you can see on the screen, so you might have some uh, mention of these, like Aviva and OSI Soft. Um, and basically, I want to guide you through um, the flow of what is digital transformation um, what is the vision of digitalization in the industry and uh, how you can apply data science uh, in, these, in these cases. Um, in the past years, uh, the world has tremendously uh, speeded up uh, in all fields, but especially in digitalization. I, I'm sure that all of you are more than aware of that. Uh, and this brings a lot of challenges and uh, this brings a lot of challenges um, to manufacturing and a lot of opportunities as well. Um, the main, the key teams here are, as you, as you might know, are IoT devices being applied, artificial intelligence being implemented in manufacturing and heavy industries as well. And uh, of course, the, the, the connectedness of workers and the connectedness of people who work in these industries. Um, what do we mean by digital transformation at its core? Um, we mean the change of work, how we work. Um, when are we working? Uh, when, do we, when do we interact with, with each other? And when do we realize if there is a situation that's happening or if there is an opportunity that's happening? Um, where do we work? How, how connected we are uh, with everything that we do together as an organization? Um, who can do what? And who can use their resources the best way? 
and uh, how do we interact with each other as organizations. Um, this is a graph by McKinsey, um, and uh, I wanted to show this to you because um, I think this is a very, very good example of how much far behind is industry and manufacturing, mining, oil and gas, uh, pharma behind in digitalization compared to other industries and how tremendous this opportunity is actually. Uh, because if you think about the past 20 or 30 years, um, all of you uh, can see around yourself like the financial sector and media and telecommunications, how much did, did digitalization uh, happened in the past deca decades. Uh, let's say that these industries are digitalized at 90 or 95% at the moment. Um, maybe it doesn't seem like that, but they're pretty digitalized already. And uh, let's compare uh, heavy industries and manufacturing and pharma to that. Um, as, as you can see on the graph, um, there is a huge opportunity here. And there is a huge curve that these industries need to go through in the next couple of decades. Uh, first and foremost, in digitalizing their assets, um, then digitalizing their workers and how they work and how they communicate with each other, and, uh, and building up their digital capital in terms of digital knowledge, digital know-how, and the digital infrastructure itself. Um, as, it's, uh, as it's very visible on the Gartner hype cycle, um, there are a lot of, lot of trends, a lot of innovations going on already in this field. Um, on the hype cycle, you can see on the vertical axis, um, the expectations. So when a new concept or a new innovation comes into place, uh, you have always like high expectations in the beginning and the expectations just go up. Like think about autonomous driving, uh, for example, expectations grow a lot and then there is a peak uh, when, you know, when, when expectations are the highest, like we will fly to the moon with electric cars and autonomous driving. Um, and then, of course, there is a disillusionment when people start to realize, like, this might have drawbacks. This might be more difficult than what we imagined. Um, and then we reach a plateau of productivity at the end when all these innovations and new concepts uh, turn into production and get get and take shape um, this is the same for manufacturing operations um, two or three years back a concept called digital twin where you have a digital twin for every asset that you have physically you have a digital twin in for that asset um, this digital twin concept was still in the like the beginning of the hype cycle and it's very interesting to see like year by year as it's climbing higher and higher uh, for the expectations, and then, of course, it will roll through and, and, and move ahead. Um, or another very good example is cloud computing in manufacturing. Um, it's, it's already pretty implemented, but still, um, there is a lot to do there as well. Um, what's actually happening uh, when we talk about operations control or manufacturing or, you know, infrastructure in a plant? Um, you can see the architecture uh, of a plant and, and how information technology is already very embedded in a plant. Um, first, we have the, the plant field team, the, the shop floor. Um, then you have the control team who are collecting all the information coming from the assets, coming from pumps, turbines, ovens, depending on what you actually do. Um, then on the top of this, you have the enterprise team uh, who are the ones who basically sit, let's say, in the office. So these are the people who do product development, do HR, marketing, everything that's on top of production. And they have an overview of all the information, what's happening in the plant and what's happening in production. And, and as a, like, as an environment to all of this, we have several uh, further systems, which are part information technology, part operations technology. And it's, it's actually amazing how these two come together recently. And this provides the opportunity for data analytics in manufacturing. And this provides the opportunity for digitalization in manufacturing, in pharma, in uh, oil and gas, and all these heavy industries. 
Um, this is not so far. Uh, this is already happening. Uh, the software uh, company I'm working with called Aviva, uh, they already have sub solutions implemented at their 20,000 customers globally. Uh, of course, each and every one of them is on a different level uh, of digitalization, but this is already here. Uh, the question is just how will we get there and how fast? Um, this is an extreme example at uh, Saudi Aramco. Uh, this is a recent uh, project of Aviva, which is uh, set to be the largest use case of, uh, of a digitalization program uh, today. Uh, this is an integrated monitoring center with this huge screen at their, at their monitoring center. Um, they basically, they're monitoring 10,000 assets uh, for Saudi Aramco. Uh, this project was completed completely remotely uh, during lockdown uh, and on time. I think this is amazing that you know this can be done. Um, and this is a centralized place where they can see all their plans, all what's happening, get alerts real time, you know, see the last needle uh, in the haystack real time. Um, so getting to analytics, uh, when do we say that analytics is predict predictive? and what makes it possible to do predictive analytics. Um, predictive analytics starts when you are able to define a baseline and you can compare your actual, uh, your actual work and your actual um, values to this baseline. So you actually have a real-time comparison, where should my asset be and where I am. And this is the best and fastest way that you can draw uh, you can draw a conclusion and you can measure like, am I, am I ahead? Do I have a problem? Is, you know, is the turbine cracking? Is there a strange noise? What's happening on the, on the ground in the plant? Uh, and when you have this capability, you are able to predict and foresee everything that might be happening in your plant just right in the moment when, when something might go wrong. Um, and when you don't have this, what's happening is that the situation has to escalate to some point when something goes really wrong. And then, of course, it's, it's not safe, it's not sustainable, um, and, and it's just generally not something you want to do in your operations. Um, predictive analytics is the main use case uh, at the moment that's more like, common in operations control. But of course, there are many different uh, types how you can use analytics um, in your production and in your, in your manufacturing operations. And uh, just to, to round it up, um, how you can get started on this. Um, I think it's very, it's very cool that if you have an operations control system, um, you don't have to throw it away in order to do analytics. The beauty of this is that this is an architecture and you can actually build this analytics layer on top of your existing infrastructure. Um, so of course you have the sensors and the PLCs uh, on the ground, and then you can you can you have your operations control, and you have um, like um, the automation automatization systems on top, where you collect all your data first, your SCADA or whatever system you have, and then you build the further layers, like the operation control systems and the analytics layers on top of this. And um, the vision for this is that once you collected all your data, you can actually have a single thread of information pushed up, um, maybe to the cloud, possibly, hopefully to the cloud. And you can make this data available to all your workers, um, them being on the shop floor or being in the management, you know, wherever they are globally. Um, so yeah, um, this is it. Uh, I, hope, I hope it's an interesting insight how you can use data analytics and advanced analytics um, in industries which might, might not be so you know, common uh, as a discussion topic. And uh, I'm happy to receive any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audiences in Bucharest, in uh, Sofia or in Budapest? If not, I'm pretty sure that our faculty director who witnessed this um, uh, keynote presentation has a couple of questions. I'm pretty sure he has. Maciej, are you there? Are you there? 
I just saw you. Hello, yes, I'm here. Let me just um, welcome from Vienna. Um, let me uh, uh, let me change it here. Okay, yes. Hi, Perfect. hello everybody. Uh, by, uh, hi, Luta. Thank you so much for this for this presentation. Hi. Uh, hi, uh, I, I was um, displaying this empty room. We don't have an open day here, but I just wanted everybody to get a little bit of a sense of how our executive classrooms look like. It's, it's, it's really beautiful, but it's even better when we have all the participants here in those uh, comfortable chairs. Uh, so yes, thank, thank you so much. Um, so I, I see a lot of opportunities that you that you emphasize, and I mean they are undeniable. Now, uh, what about risks? What risks do you see uh, for for the industries, for employees, for customers, from uh, you know in in this move towards analytics? Yes, um, uh, it's not all the good thing, right? Yeah, of course, as always. <laughs> um, the biggest risk is, uh, is probably the safety of data. Um, like there have been recent cases as well, uh, when, uh, when there was um, intrusion into plants and intrusion into, I think it was a, a water processing facility, maybe in Ontario, Canada, I'm not sure. Um, of course, it's it's data it's uh, it's data security, uh, and this is this is where it becomes really interesting of when when you talk about digitalization and how information technology and operation technology meet meet each other, because how it's been so far is that uh, these areas has been siloed, and this is an organizational question as well. Like these people have been siloed; they haven't really talked much. There has been like some connection between them. But as you unify all these uh, processes, the IT system, uh, data security becomes an issue because the plant is not separated anymore from the IT system of the enterprise. So actually what's happening in the enterprise in terms of data security also affects the plant. So a threat or an intrusion can easily get into the plant if you are not careful enough when you are building all this architecture. Uh, so data security, I think is number one risk. Um, and, but besides that, um, honestly, I, I, see, I see mostly the advantages of this. No, thank you so much. This is, this is very helpful. I also want to ask you about, you know, how these technological changes and the changes of the role of, of data uh, and, and, and analytics, yes, both actually, uh, in your view, impact the very concept of what leadership is. Because, my, 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 you know, I, I mean, leadership uh, was always considered this soft skill, yes, this almost magical or mystical skill. Um, there is this very famous book, The Leadership Mystique, yes. Um, a lot of things, including what you are describing, but also um, connected things like uh, um, development in behavioral economics, uh, increasingly suggest that leadership will become much more a science than this mystique. Um, do you agree with this? Do you see a future for people who don't have, uh, who don't understand analytics? in top echelons of leadership, of business leadership. Uh, what's, your, what's your take on this? I think that uh, I see a really bright future for people who understand analytics. And I see it's, it's not only about leadership. I think everyday life, I see a lot of challenges for people who are not, who are not following you know, all this development, like digitalization in general, it affects everything we do. And, uh, and especially in leadership, especially in these industries, which all influence every single day of our lives, like water treatment, pharmaceuticals, um, energy, food and beverages, 
it's it's all about these products it's all about these services um how how you could lead in these industries if you don't have enough information if you don't you don't have the capacity to make a data driven decision like how could you ensure that you are running your factory in a sustainable way if if you're not doing everything you can to you know like use the data that you already have and uh, you know in in most factories they have thousands of sensors and they just save that time series data and it sits there and they don't do any analytics they don't do any asset management they don't do any forecasting like energy forecasting for example like how powerful it could be if if you could better forecast your energy need as a factory uh, and you could actually save energy or, or 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 load it back if you have solar panels for example like what if every little factory has this and it, it you know it's it's infinite so i think yeah this is part of leadership now um, that you have to be data minded you have to understand these concepts and 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 you have to be forward looking and and get ahead in terms of technology as well so can i be a little actually a little more uh, you know a, a little even a little stronger in this i think you are very diplomatic and which is probably good for a data scientist so that you you know uh, don't scare people, but you know, I am not a data scientist, but uh, I am a management scholar. And my sense is that a lot of uh, people who come for the CEO executive MBA are frankly sometimes surprised why we focus so much on those quantitative access in the uh, uh, aspects in the EMBA for the open world. And, uh, you know, my, my, my sense is that it's partly because you know, the average age of CEO executive MBA participant is 39 years old, yes? So a lot of people in kind of our generation, because I am actually of, of a similar generation, not the same generation as our participant, a lot of people of our generation got, got used to the idea of working with people in, who are now in their 60s or maybe even 70s and helping him, them, uh, you know, kind of sort out the email. Yes, and we have this implicit idea that when you are very high up, you will always have people who kind of help you with those things, even if you are completely illiterate. But my 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 feeling is that this is this is a huge risk. That this is false, and it's huge risk because there was it, 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 the technology came kind of during the time when we were you know young adults, and people who were you know one generation behind us were already kind of at very high levels. So they could afford, you know, having somebody check their email and like make sure like they understand basic things, uh, technological. My sense is that because technology has moved so far now, you will not be able to get to these positions of top leadership unless you are very skilled in data-driven decision-making. So it's, we, and, and this is dangerous for people of our generation because we had those technologically illiterate role models in the previous generation, and we can, we may fall under the uh, myth or an impression of wishful thinking that it's going to be the same with us. And I think we need to disabuse ourselves from that notion. It's no longer going to be possible to reach top levels of leadership if you don't understand data, if you don't make decisions based on data, if, if, if all these technologies are black box for you. Uh, and, you know, feel free to disagree with my radical statements here, but I really think this is important for people to understand that that's the reality, that this time, the time when people could be at the top level and could be digitally literate uh, is gone and it's not coming back. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Just like you can't raise kids these days without, you know, operating an iPad. Uh, you can't really lead people who are surrounded by all this technology uh, if you don't understand what's happening. So, you know, right now, even the last operator on the shop floor of a plant has artificial intelligence on an iPad. 
and they get alerts based on the camera picture uh, of the camera that's in the plant, which is watching all the equipment. They get alerts, like something is going wrong. Uh, and then they, they use this technology every single day. So how could you lead these people if you don't understand what's happening to them and, and how they're using all this? Yeah. Exactly. And what we are doing in the program is if, 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 you, if you are not on this train yet, this is your last chance. And we get you in this so-called standard track, the S track, where you get the basics from like amazing people and amazing instructors like Lutza. If you are already on this train, you don't need to suffer through the standard track and just like, you know, be bored with it. We put you immediately in the advanced track when you really can like push this to the cutting edge and you, and you, you know, work with people like Nicholas Cohen, Cohen you know, the Harvard uh, PhD professor with, you know, extensive publications in supply chain, artificial intelligence. So like, you know, Regardless of whether you are on this on this uh, uh, data analytics train or not, uh, the the program will be will be of value for you. And I think uh, Thomas, this is like a perfect transition to probably what you want because like we can discuss with uh, with with Lutza for for ages, but I, I I'm sure you are you are uh, keeping the agenda here. Exactly, because I collected a, a series of questions from the chat so far. I allowed myself to group them for you and me, much if you want to participate in answering these questions. So I'm not all by myself with, with the questions. Sure. So uh, let's start with the elephant in the room. What, what about COVID? What are the measures on campus? How are we enabling a learning experience despite of the pandemic? Oh, yeah, sure. And so, I mean, a lot of this you already explained on the online thing. So online, you, you know, you can join online at any time. Uh, and, uh, but we really do everything possible to keep this uh, experience on site. We've been the first ones in Vienna to roll out uh, mass uh, COVID testing for um, uh, all our uh, participants, uh, uh, the antigen testing uh, a year ago. Now we are exploring even uh, uh, rapid PCR tests so that when you come to class, you know, you can feel safe, you can feel that infections are not going to, are not going to affect you. Um, uh, uh, we, you know, have all those uh, sanitary protocols, distancing. So, so basically, what we do is we spend no effort to make the on-site modules uh, safe, but for everybody who wants and can travel, to keep the option of being on-site. And I can say with with a lot of pride that, like. Uh, Throughout the pandemic, we had only one module in winter 2020 when there was total lockdown. Maybe you, you, you remember all those, all those lockdowns and waves are now blurring in our memory. But uh, there was a moment when like the entire Europe was in lockdown. That one module we needed to do online, we had no other choice. Every other module throughout the pandemic was uh, had an on-site option. You could actually participate on-site. Speaking of online participation, I received the question, what is the average size of a team and how many of them participating online, especially this year? Um, I'm not sure if that question refers to the support teams, to the size of- I think it's support teams. I think it's support teams. Yeah, so support team is four or five people. Uh, that's very simple. Uh, now, you need to uh, understand that the support teams work a lot between the modules. And then it's, it's online, uh, regardless of COVID, yes? That's like by design. You meet during the module, but because support is so diverse, you walk, uh, you know, it's a, dis it's a distance walk between the modules. So for example, when you work on a project. Now, when you work in the module, well, the majority of people are uh, on site, yes? Usually it's just one person who, at most who is online because people really want to come and people really, you know, make an effort to be 
on site. So, so it's either everybody on site or maybe just one person online. That, that's, that's, that would be the response. If that question did not refer to support teams, but the um, cohort size, the, 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 the average cohort size in the executive MBA is around 60 um, people, 60 um, participants in the current cohort. And um, how many of them are participating online, especially this year? This question cannot be answered because you can freely decide at every module if you want to do it online or on, on, on site. So there are modules when, when there's a tendency that more people are doing it online because of private reasons or travel restrictions. And there are um, modules when less people are opting in for the online um, opportunity. So um, it's, it's up to you, but the overall majority decides to join on site. The online participant, participants is a minority, just to be clear. You will not be um, all by yourself in an empty classroom with everybody online. Um, online is the exception, but of course we understand that exceptions, need, uh, exceptions apply. Um, the next question deals with um, what are the application requirements and what is the application process? Amache, if you allow, I will take that question. Um, the application requirements are pretty straightforward. We expect people to have eight years of work experience, of which um, at least three years of any kind of managerial or leadership experience. Um, people need, would, have, would need to have an undergraduate university degree from every um, field of study that you can imagine. Could be culture, could be business, could be engineering, could be um, uh, from med school, um, it's up to you. Um, of course, you would need to, prov to provide a proof of English, which shouldn't be a problem in times like this because TOEFL and IELTS and Cambridge and Duolingo, they offer um, home uh, versions in order to do it online. If you're a native speaker or if your um, degree was fully taught in English, you're exempt from that rule. Um, there is no other um, test required, like no uh, GMAT or uh, SAT test. Um, and the application process is straightforward. You are applying through our website. It's an online application. You are um, creating a profile. You're uploading your, pro um, your documents, your application documents. You would need your um, a CV and a motivation letter, of course. You would need reference letters. You would need um, uh, uh, the proof of English, if applicable, university transcripts and university certificates. Everything can be uploaded. And once you've uploaded and, and completed your application, we will check in a promptly, matter, uh, prom promptly manner, we will uh, check your application documents for completeness and correctness. And you will be invited for an online interview. The online interview, which will be um, uh, done with um, one of our faculty members, is based on a fixed, uh, based on a questionnaire on, based on fixed, um, I think it's 43 categories, 43 questions. Um, we are not playing mind 48. games. 48 in the meantime. Wow. Um, we're not playing mind games in the interviews. It's just a catalog of questions in order to get to know you better, because we have a limited time in order to get to know you and to assess you. So we will assess your leadership style, your experience, your uh, motivation. We will not play mind games in the interview. Assuming that you will, that you're passing this, the interview stage, your case will be presented to a um, admission committee because every participant in executive MBA is handpicked. And assuming that you um, um, receive their approval, you will receive a positive admission decision in only a couple of weeks. So if you're applying right now, I cannot make a promise, but I'm pretty confident that you will receive an admission decision before the holidays. Um, the next question for you, for our teacher, Maciej, is are there any exams? What about the thesis? Yes. Um... So uh, in a minority of courses, including Luther's course, uh, there is an exam. However, it's very important to understand exam is not like you sit in a room and write something on a piece of paper. First of all, we don't spend your precious module time on writing exams. This is a time to exchange ideas, to learn, uh, to debate. Um, exams take place outside of the modules. We have. 10-day exam periods where you basically during a 10-day period you choose a two-hour slot of your choice 
and you do your exam online. The only thing is once you start, you need to finish it uh, in one go. You can't, uh, you know, kind of break it into pieces, but but it's your choice when to do it. Now, as I said, it's a minority of courses, and majority of courses you work on projects in your support teams. I already discussed support teams, um, so so this is uh, uh, this is on the this is on the on the exams. The thesis. Okay, we don't have the thesis, we have a capstone project. What is a capstone project? A capstone project is uh, an applied project in which you take the learnings from C Executive MBA and apply it into real life, into real organizations, into real, real problems of your choice. It's supervised by a faculty, but you choose where to apply it, how to apply it, you, it can be a consulting engagement. It can be something you do for your work. You can take an externship and do for some uh, work, some for other organizations, or maybe even a non-profit. Or you may even go to our award-winning innovation lab, which is the, the top incubator, business incubator in Central Europe. And you can do a full business incubation and you can start a new business as part of your capsule. There are multiple um, opportunities, but the basic idea is you take what you've learned and you show us that you can apply it because it's all about changing the real world and your leadership, your organizations. That's the approach to a thesis. It's not to create, you know, an, a magnum opus that is going to collect dust on the shelf. It's, it's about changing the world. Uh, not in a very, necessarily in a very lofty and idealistic and wishful thinking type of way, in a concrete way, making your team, making your business better, more efficient, you know, more uh, challenging uh, the acquired dogmas, as we say, in the open society spirit, uh, doing something new, doing something innovative. That's the kind of mentality, that's the kind of approach we expect and Capstone is kind of, as the name suggests, uh, an icing on the cake, yes? I think that shows how much thought we put into the concept of the modular format because we acknowledge, we know that you're executives and you don't have much time on your hands to pursue this degree and to uh, excel in your job. So we don't want to waste your time in sitting in libraries and doing research on, on, on thesis papers, which Honestly, never, nobody will ever read again in the future. So you will be graduating with the 10th module and you're uh, done. Um, in view of the time, I would like to conclude the open day uh, tonight with maybe one of the most important questions out there on, on, on joining such a program. And the question is, is there financial support? Are there any scholarships and fellowships? And the clear answer is yes, we offer a variety of financial support. We are happy to provide financial support. We consider you as talent that we would like to invest in and not, uh, uh, we're not giving away charity. So um, if you would like to give to, um, let, me give, let me give you an overview of the financial support that we offer. We offer three options, the Open World Scholarship, which aims at people who are, who have a history of breaking down barriers, breaking down dogmas, very, very much aligned with our mission of open society. It's not excluded to people from NGO, but from my experience, the most applicants for this uh, scholarship come from the NGO field, but of course, people from the corporate world can apply for it as well. The second stream of financial support is the need-based scholarship, which only takes into consideration your income situation and the country of residence you're living in because it makes a difference if you're a marketing manager in Ukraine or in Germany in the same position. It's non-competitive and I would say, frankly speaking, it's the more convenient, the easiest to get because it's non-competitive. And the third stream is merit-based country-specific um, fellowships, which are competitive and are aiming at people. We call them empowerment um, fellowships as well because we want to empower certain groups of our society which have not had which have not been able to pursue higher education programs like this. For example, we've established a, um, a fellowship for businesswomen in Bulgaria. We have established uh, international 
uh, female leaders um, fellowships. We have established an LGBTIQ fellowship, which is applicable international. Fellowships for managers with a disability, um, managers with coming from the Roma Sinti ethnicity, um, diversity fellowships in France and the UK, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many of them. I would strongly encourage you to uh, book a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me if you need further advice on your scholarship options, because together, listening to your background, I'm, it's easy for me to give you personal advice on which scholarship, which fellowship would be most applicable to you and where you have the highest chances, chances to get such a scholarship or fellowship. Um, in view of the time, I would like to conclude this session. I would like to very much thank uh, Stefan Stürzer from Advantage Austria tonight. I would like to thank Elena for coming in tonight. I would like to uh, thank Lutza for her keynote presentation and from Mache for the academic uh, discussion with Lutza. I would like to thank everybody joining us in Bucharest, Budapest, and Sofia. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Good night from Bucharest.